time. It's Into Infinity live broadcast and I'm Heike. Yeah, so today's uh, session is uh, yeah, separated into three parts. So in the beginning I want to talk a little bit about how do we actually perceive reality, how do we perceive the universe actually uh, as humanity. And, and also then how is this knowledge, has, how has it been developed over time? Uh, where is knowledge actually coming from? Uh, a little bit about the ancient history. And in the third part, yeah, we're going to get creative and talk more about the geometry. Have you ever wondered where, yeah, where everything comes from? Why the universe works how it does? Have you ever asked yourself the question, what's out there? Is there something bigger to life? <laughs> Um, yeah, just questions like that and, and really thinking about the broader sense of life because for most people, I guess, um, we're very busy in our everyday life and uh, we never really get the time to think about the bigger questions. And it's quite interesting if you think about it because, yeah, we're, we're born on this, on this planet and we kind of get adjusted when we grow up to the environment and um, we learn how to take in information from the outside and we take it on and have you ever asked yourself the question so how was it before how did it all start and um, yeah is there a bigger meaning to life because the universe is quite vast and amazing and um, and in a sense it's very interesting to, that we don't really remember, we don't remember much about where we come from because this is what happens with memory. You are very young and you probably don't even remember what happened before you were two years old. And the same goes for everything else and for the whole of humanity. We're just taking on the knowledge that ha has been taught and um, yeah, we don't really understand where it comes from. Yeah, reality. What is it? How do we see reality? And I like this image because it kind of, uh, it's an analogy, right? So think about reality as kind of like a tree. And in the tree, you have the branches, which, is, which are above the ground, the things that we can see. And then below the ground, we have the roots. And the roots are very important because the tree actually grows from the roots. But we don't see the roots. And in a sense, reality is the same. So there are things that we can interact with, the physical reality, which I would say is like matter. And then there's the other part, which is actually yourself, your, your own being, which is kind of using this matter, the body, but in a sense, you could say it's consciousness. And consciousness kind of, yeah, it, it's very difficult for science to um, explore consciousness because it's kind of outside of the world of matter. And um, yeah, it's been always a very big topic to explore. What is consciousness, consciousness and how does consciousness interact with matter? And uh, the tree, in a sense, shows this quite well. And if you think about, okay, how do we look at the universe? What are the different perspectives? Yeah, and we go from the very large scales. Um, and we have the sciences, obviously. In science, we look at the reality in an objective way. We try to analyze it. So astronomy deals with the broader perspective of reality, how the planets are moving, gravity, time spaces, stuff like that. Things that are, that are so much beyond actually our own life because we're kind of like little ants in that scale. Um, but yeah, this is where it starts to explain the larger scales of the universe. And we do deal with things like that as well. Then below that, you could say, this is where our planet is. And um, we try to study, we can um, yeah, summarize this as the Earth sciences, how, how the planet is working, the ecology of the planet, and so on, the weather. And then below the planet, you could say, is life. And the life is consisting out of billions of cells, or trillions of cells, actually, uh, if it's plants or organisms. And uh, all of these are made out of cells. In biology and this is actually where kind of my background is biology and then you go from biology s smaller in scale and inside of the cells 
you have millions of or trillions of molecules that goes into the field of chemistry and how these molecules are interacting with each other so make so it makes the cell work like a living being in a sense and then below the molecules and that's when we come really to the foundation of reality is yeah is the atom and the atom is kind of a very strange <laughs> kind of strange area because it's just vibrating and the energy is kind of uh, flickering in and out of existence. It gets very, very strange in that area, in that field. And all of this is based on mathematics. Yeah, mathematics is, in a sense, numbers. And the numbers, even though they're not in the manifestable reality, but they do describe it and they do, we can express what's happening in, in the world of matter through mathematics. And mathematics is the foundation of all of the sciences, actually. So if there's one language and how we can explain the, the world of matter, then it is mathematics. How or what is dealing with consciousness then? Because the sciences don't really deal with consciousness. Even though quantum physics, they start to, to get into, into that realm. But uh, we have the other side, which is more the philosophical side of life. The questions of, of, about who we are. Uh, what is it that makes us us <laughs> and um, yeah the broader sense of um, where we where are we going and um, we have with that spirituality you could say under that umbrella we have stuff like yoga and it, it's more and more trendy to for people to get into that field because people feel like that there's more to life than the physical reality and then obviously we have the religions yeah, the religions deal with the idea of consciousness, that, that there might be a supreme consciousness where everything stems from. But uh, in our future courses, we're actually dealing with all of these things, because um, there's one thing that really unites it all, and we'll find out what that is. A growing number of physicists are saying reality is made of information. What does that even mean? Well, information is meaning in the form of symbolism. A language or code provide this kind of information conveying symbolism. A very different type of symbol is one that represents itself. Geometric symbols can do that. A cube can represent love, if we say it does, or it can represent, really, with minimal subjectivity, itself. Could there be a language or code made out of geometry? What type of information would such a language express? So in that video uh, from E8, uh, you saw the symbol in the cave, and that symbol was the seed uh, or flower of life. Uh, this is called the seed of life and the bigger version is the flower of life and you see it all around the world uh, this is actually uh, I'm in India right now and this is actually a picture that I took in Hampi uh, you can find it in some of the columns in the ruins this is in Turkey on the wall or actually on the floor it's on the floor this one is in the forbidden city in Beijing and this one is from Leonardo da Vinci in one of his uh, sketchbooks and that one is the oldest one found it's uh, from Abydos, Egypt, and it, well, some say it's 4,000 years old or older than that. And it's very interesting, remarkable how this thing was made. Um, but we'll talk about this more in future lessons. So what's amazing is that actually it doesn't matter which culture you're looking at, they all unify in this one pattern. And uh, so this workshop was about the geometry of the universe, and it seems like it all goes, it, it, it nails it down to one image. And we're going to draw it later on. Yeah, but it's not only this image, there's much more to explore in our ancient history because we don't really know what happened because the more we go back in time, the more blurry it gets and we don't really know how the civilizations were working because the only way we can know is what they have left behind. Um, and yeah, time can destroy things. So what we're left with are these amazing structures um, such as yeah, here Stonehenge pyramids, temples, um, quite amazing. 
architectures. And what's cool about it is there's a lot of geometric knowledge in there. You can already see it. Yeah, pyramids, very clear example of geometry. And I want to tell you a little bit about the history. So uh, if we go very, very as far as we can go back in time, then we find these megalithic structures, megalithic structures um, such as Stonehenge. And uh, some people say it belongs to the Neolithic era or megalithic era. And uh, they don't know how old it is, but could be something like over 10,000 years old. But what's amazing about it is, is these are not random stones. Uh, they actually incorporate a lot of geometrical ratios and proportions and some cosmological knowledge as well. And it seems like that these civilizations seem to have the technology to build these megaliths because they're, they're really like heavy, <laughs> really heavy things. And we don't know how to do it today. So there seems to be technology that may have been lost. After the megalithic era, we have, um, actually it's not after, maybe it's even parallel. We don't really know how far back in time it goes. But in India is a, is a really uh, great place for knowledge and geometric knowledge. And it's called the Vedic Age. And uh, yeah, it all is based on the Vedas, which is the oldest spirit, spiritual scriptures found. And um, these are basically scriptures that were then written down from sutras. So actually it was just Babas meditating and um, yeah, singing these sutras and to pass them on from generation to generation until they were written down. And uh, what you find in there is that there's a lot of knowledge about mathematics, such as the number zero. And uh, also all the geometric mandalas, they show us that it seems like ancient India had a lot of uh, knowledge about geometry. And that's why we got fascinated about it, because that's how I got in contact with the geometry. <laughs> Later on, we have um, yeah, the land of Mesopotamia, uh, which is such as ancient Greek, Egypt, uh, the Sumerian and Babylonian cultures, which are the first civilizations of the West with the first uh, numerical system. And they all also have obviously a lot of knowledge contained in the ancient pyramids. And uh, we also show you in our future lessons how actually the pyramids and the Stonehenge are linked together. Yeah. Then a very important culture, and that's what our stuff is based on mainly, is ancient Greece. And we talk about ancient Greece uh, a bit more in a bit. but this is really important because the stuff that we know today of science, um, all the academic institutions, they're actually based on the very first uh, learning system and that was in ancient Greece. And uh, one of their core subjects was, was actually geometry and as part of a metaphysical thinking. And I explain to you in a bit what metaphysics is. Then this knowledge got lost and a few thousand years later, uh, on a few hundred years <laughs> later, uh, we got the Renaissance period where a lot of the knowledge got rediscovered um, by people like Da Vinci and Galileo. Galilei. Uh, he was uh, contributed to discover the, or, yeah, discover the drawing compass. Um, and then we have Johannes Kepler, which is a German cosmologist who was looking at the planets and uh, thought that they all move uh, through geometric principles which is all based on the knowledge of the ancient Greece with um, yeah, Plato, one of the big Greek philosophers. And today, yeah, today, uh, some of this knowledge is now coming back thanks to the New Age movement, yoga and all this stuff. You've probably seen these images all around. I mean, they're super trendy. A lot of people have tattoos like that. But actually, it's much more than just nice symbols. Uh, there's actually a lot of science uh, attributed to these shapes. And uh, one of the, a few people that deal with that, um, who became known in that field, was Buckminster Fuller, who was talking a lot about 3D geometry. And then we have um, Nassim Haramein. He's quite famous as a kind of a French scientist, but uh, he's a cosmologist um, with his new theory of a holographic universe, that basically he's saying that uh, the whole universe is basically like a hologram, an illusion. <laughs> And uh, thanks to the advent of computers, uh, we can go now more into the idea of fractal geometry, so pattern, the repetition of pattern into infinity. And this is uh, our next workshop after this one on Wednesday. Colin will talk about fractal geometry in his uh, online series. 
And then obviously, yeah, there's this term. I didn't mention it before, but sacred geometry is actually what they would call these shapes. It's called sacred because um, with it comes the idea of a sense that there is a divine structure, um, some sort of spiritual aspect to that. And um, yeah, we'll find out that uh, this seems to be very much true. Yeah, I want to talk about ancient Greece because a lot of our stuff is based on it. And I think there were some great minds uh, back in the day. And we would like to go back to that because if you think about it today, we have so many different fields of um, study. And uh, I felt it when I was studying myself that, okay, you are in this field now, I'm a biologist or whatever, engineer, and you don't really deal with some of the other fields. And, and I think um, it's better if we look at things more in a holistic way and trying to understand the common features of everything. So you're not specialized, but more of, yeah, you understand the broader perspective of reality. So the ancient Greeks were doing that. Um, they, they set up the first school of higher education because they thought it was really important to educate people of society because if people of society are educated, then society will be a good society. And uh, one of the most yeah, famous philosoph philosophers is Plato. A lot of the stuff that we do is based also on Plato. And he said that geometry will draw the soul toward truth and create the spirit of philosophy which means now comes the other part, let's say the spiritual side or metaphysical side, that is also by understanding geometry, we can understand ourselves much better. Yeah, all the sciences of today are actually based on this system that I present you right here, <clears throat> which is the liberal arts, which were intended to free a person, free the person to express themselves uh, as an individual, uh, especially in front of court. Uh, not like today. Today we have lawyers and they do everything for us. No, back in the day it was about becoming a very intelligent person yourself and um, defending yourself if necessary and understanding the nature of reality. And the seven liberal arts were divided into, into two fields. Uh, one is the trivium, which is all about words, so language, logic, rhetoric and grammar which today you could say is like liter literature and um, journalism. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this, this kind of stuff. And then on the other hand, you have the quadrivium, which is uh, numbers, the sciences of today. But back in the day, uh, it was divided into four. That's why quadrivium. And that is geometry, numbers in space, everything that we can see, basically. Then we have uh, numbers in time, like, yeah. Rhythm, for example, that's music. And uh, we have numbers in space-time, like the planets, they are moving, uh, cosmology. And then we have the, yeah, the study of just pure numbers themselves, which is uh, arithmetics, in a sense, our today, yeah, mathematics. And, uh, but back in the day, they were really thinking about all these things and how they're interlinked with each other. So music, for example, which is not part of scientific studies today, was a big part because sound and frequencies, they actually do um, explain a lot of things. And I actually posted a video yesterday, I think, on our um, community, our Into Infinity community on Facebook, where they showed that they could levitate things just through sound. Um, so, yeah. By understanding music, maybe we can also start to create more and more technologies yeah, that will help us. So uh, this is something that probably um, Baptiste will talk about more in the future uh, in his online lessons. All right. So the liberal arts are the basis of our modern science, yet the modern science are now very different to what it was before. We'll go back to this because we find that the system of learning is very simple. And, uh, but it gives us a lot of revelations about reality. Yeah, let's talk about metaphysics because in their studies, one of the very important things was uh, the philosophy part, um, which is also not a part of science today. Yeah, bringing in philosophical questions and um, the originator of this word is Aristotle, which is uh, actually Plato's student. And um, it means that it merges science because physics is science, 
uh, with philosophy because meta means beyond science. And um, if you remember this journey that we, that we went through in the beginning from the smallest to the larger scales, it's actually most of the stuff is, yeah, it's pretty, it's not solid at all. It's not matter at all. <clears throat> and it's the stuff that we say is what le lies beyond. So by studying metaphysics, you're not only studying the stuff that you can perceive, but also the things that you may not perceive. And this is a really, really nice quote from Aristotle. He says, metaphysics involves intuitive knowledge of unprovable starting points, concepts and truth, and demonstrative knowledge of what follows from them. In other words, it means with metaphysics, sometimes you start with an idea, your own concept of how do you think this reality works, and then you try to prove it, rather than, other than the other way around. So, and this is also in a sense what we're doing. We, we're starting with a geometric pattern and see how it relates to reality. And one of the very good examples of metaphysical thinking is this um, thought experiment from Plato. It's called Plato's Allegory Cave or Plato's Cave. And in this um, idea, in the story, uh, he says that they're actually a, a group of people over here and they're chained on a wall all of their life. And the only thing they perceive of reality are the shadows that are projected on the opposite wall. They don't see actually where the shadows come from. They don't see any of the things that are beyond their perception. And that again shows us that that's what met metaphysics is. It's actually looking beyond what you think, uh, what you, you perceive. And he says that actually everything in the physical is just a reflection of an ideal form. So these are the forms and they project an image for us to perceive. And uh, if, you, if you follow this idea, then it's like, okay, actually what reality is, it's like you should, you should look beyond the shadows of the wall and see the true nature of reality because that's when you get closer to the bigger picture. And in his story, it was like that one of the prisoners he freed himself and uh, he went out of the cave wall and first his, uh, he had the light, the natural light was very blinding to him and uh, he had to get adjusted to it first but once he saw it he was amazed that he was so blind before and so he went back and uh, telling them about this bigger reality outside but then they would uh, say well he's crazy because they don't believe it. <laughs> yeah? So that's quite an interesting analogy to new ideas sometimes that we should also just be open to new ideas because we don't know, you know, sometimes it takes a while to uh, prove these ideas as well. And also, yeah, the idea with him being blinded at first, like the idea of enlightenment um, is that when you are exposed to higher energies at first, it might be um, uncomfortable. To wake up is uncomfortable sometimes. You have to go through challenges first in order to grow. And um, that's why I really like this the story. So it shows us that the true reality lies beyond our perception and you say that there are forms, uh, ideal forms, well we can stand it with geometry because geometry uh, are ideal forms. <laughs> yeah. Think about reality every day. <laughs> We're walking in this plane of existence and, uh, and what we can experience is actually we're living in some sort of space. 3D space and we build houses uh, like this and it, it's quite geometric in a sense and even the way we perceive the world I mean we're walking on a flat plane in a sense the horizon line um, this is a 90 degree angle uh, we use geometry in, uh, in a lot of our things in the way we perceive the reality and but yeah what is then this space and how is it linked to geometry and I like this met metaphor or analogy uh, think about reality there's matter we said there's consciousness yeah? but there's a lot of space a lot of space and um, and in a sense you could say that geometry which actually means yeah measuring the earth measuring space it it implies it is space and then there's a matter which in a sense is energy and energy you could see it as the water in a, in a glass, and the glass is the geometry. Yeah. The glass is the geometry, and the water is the energy. And that's quite interesting because in Taoism, um, spiritual teachings, they say everything in reality is actually like a flow of water. 
and it always is changing. It never ever stands still. And uh, but at the same time, if you think about our reality, it's actually quite manifest. It, it's not like it doesn't feel like it's moving a lot. It's all quite very solid. And so how then is the solidity being held in place? Well, you will have to have some sort of construct, some sort of structure that holds this energy. And uh, we would say that actually maybe the space itself is geometric and that geometry holds, holds the energy in place. Because if you think about quantum physics, everything is fluctuating, vibrating and getting very crazy. But then at the same time, when we come here, my hand is quite solid and stays still. And it feels quite solid, even though on the very, um, on the lowest level, it's not. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, that analogy is great because it tells us that geometry is space and energy is the water in the glass. And now the question is, if you're thinking about space, what kind of space is it then? And that can describe it. And now we're going back to Plato in ancient Greece, because if you think about 3D space, there are actually only these five shapes that we need to deal with alongside the, the sphere. But in terms of straight lines, we only have five forms that describe 3D space um, in terms of regularity. Because when we said in the beginning, everything's information, everything is kind of a code that unfolds, then this code needs to follow very simple rules. And let's say you have a dot and it expands, let's say in four directions equally, then it will create automatically this shape, the tetrahedron. If you have a dot that divides in eight spaces totally equally, then it will create a cube. And if you're following this pattern, <clears throat> then there's only these five shapes that exist where you can do that, where also the relationship between the um, dots follow a very um, yeah, regular, regular forms, like an equilateral triangle. Everything is in balance, basically, in equilibrium. And we're not going to talk about these shapes today in depth, but I wanted to mention them there because they're very important, and I will talk about this much more in future lessons. So we live in space, and it seems like space is geometric. So by understanding the geometry, we will understand the space, and we understand the structures in space as well. Yeah, 99.99 percent, actually, it's 99.99 something, is space of the atom is space. So almost hardly anything is matter. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, hardly anything is energy, and you could. For example, compress the whole world, taking out all the space that we saw in the beginning that is inside the atom, and you shrink it down that there's no space, and you'll probably fit it inside of a single cube of sugar. <laughs> so there's a lot of space. And so the meta part of metaphysics becomes quite important, isn't it? The geometric part of reality becomes quite important if you want to understand the reality. But most of the time in, the science, in our scientific thinking, we're all <clears throat> focused so much on the 0.0001%. So we say, let's focus on the 99.999, and then maybe we can understand the 0.001. There you go. This is what we just drew, online or offline, the seven circles, and it completes the first layer after the first circle. You could say that's the next layer, and uh, that's why it's also called the perfect seal. And um, yeah, you can already see that with this process, we've created a lot of dots. In a sense, you could say that reality is like a dot space, isn't it? Everything is made out of dots because it's all made out of atoms. But these atoms are all spaced in certain ways. Yeah, So my eyes are, have a certain length to each other. Everything follows certain proportions. And this shape gives us a certain proportion inside. And um, yeah, I want to show you now how much more it can evolve to, because you see that there's actually more nodes on the outside and if we follow that pattern, ta -da, yeah, we get to this um, very beautiful pattern. So after seven, we get the seven seed of life. We add another round, and we get to the flower of life. You can try it out yourself. Uh, these are were the two images we were talking about in the beginning. Sometimes they also show it in, like this way, but actually we have uh, developed our own ontology because. Uh, yeah, just to clarify certain words, because uh, this one has actually 19 circles, and if you add another round, actually another two rounds, 
you get to 37 and we have called this shape the moonflower. At the moment you, uh, you find it on the internet as the flower of life as well, but uh, there is a distinction between these two. There's more information in here and we found out that it seemed to be linked somehow to the moon. Hmm. Yeah, and if we start to expand this again, we get to 61 and we call it the flower of heaven. It's more mystical side of uh, what we discovered here. And we find out more in our future workshops. But what's amazing about it is once you reach the stage of 61, this is when more information can come out of this image. You will have, instead of overlapping circles, you can have full circles next to each other, just like coins. Yeah, coins arranged next to each other. And these are ex exactly 13. And this is called the fruit of life. A very uh, yeah, mystical, spiritual symbol. And when you connect all the centers together, then you get to this image. And this is the Metrotron's cube, which is another yeah, very uh, famous image that you find in spiritual communities. Now, this is very important because once you get here, and you highlight just certain areas of this one, you can actually see that it projects or shows us the uh, shadow projection of the five platonic solids. 3D space, what we're talking about in the beginning. So these are the five, and this one, yeah, is actually this one, just two of them together, the star tetrahedron. Now, it becomes very interesting. So this simple, simple code of overlapping circles started to make what we know as 3D space. So there it is, the foundation of reality, and people refer to exactly the, this process to sacred geometry. This is a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of people find, they yeah, like it as tattoos and stuff, so this is what sacred geometry is. And you see that on each stage it builds up more and more um, information, which shows uh, exactly what I just explained to you in a video. So you had one circle that expanded into more into the seed of life. There you go. This is what you were drawing. This was expanding more and more to the flower of life or the moon flower in this case. And then it would create the 13 full circles, the fruit of life, which you can connect now all the all the nodes together, all the center centers from each circle, and it create this image called Metatron's cube. And uh, once you highlight certain things, you see it creates the 3D geometries. Now, obviously, I took this video from someone on YouTube. Um, and we uh, have our own ideas about these shapes, but uh, yeah, here you see how they are looking in 3D and that they are actually also related to the five elements. Um, yeah, this idea that the world is made out of five elements, which is uh, yeah, more of a spiritual thought in a sense. There is a cube. In our future workshop, we talk more about the five elements, and actually, we have a new suggestion um, on how you can also label them in a different way, and uh, that there are good reasons to maybe change also that labeling of which which of the solids can be related to which element, and what actually elements mean. Because when we talk about chemistry, chemistry, yeah, we have like 81 stable elements, but this means more in the sense of um, states of matter in a sense. All right, this is the icosahedron. And then we have the last one, which is a bit tricky to find, <laughs> if you draw it, is the dodecahedron. This was hidden for a long time. Yeah. All right. That's it. So the idea was then basically, is there a blueprint that comes out of geometry, like a geometric language that follows the pattern of what you just created, the seed of life, expands and creates 3D space, which then is the blueprint for the atomic realm, is the, which is basically the, the unit of the whole of reality, chemistry, biology, and so on, and the human blueprint itself. And I like this idea of 
uh, a house is made out of bricks, while the universe is made from geometric forms, isn't it? So what is the geometry of the universe? Well, it's any of those shapes, really, but uh, it's a process that we have to follow and to understand how it unfolds. And we can understand all of the perspectives that I was talking about in the beginning, all of the sciences, and possibly we can start to understand more about our consciousness itself. And then if you look around yourself, you see there is so much geometry around us. Yeah, just go have a walk in nature and you see actually they all follow, follow symmetries, patterns, um, shapes. And that's why it makes sense that probably there is a foundation of geometry to explain the universe. So next week, Colin um, will talk more about these patterns and how they actually can be produced by mathematics. Uh, so these are called fractals, so repetitive patterns. So check it out on Wednesday. Um, he will talk about it. So I'm just going to review now. Yeah, it was a bit slow in the chat, but hopefully next time get more active. We're getting now very quickly to the, uh, to the drawing part, but I would like just to finish off the knowledge for those who maybe don't want to go into the creative side. But we talk about three things. The universe, how do we perceive the world? Well. It's very simple. There's just two things in the universe that, uh, that, that we can distinguish, which is the world of matter and the world of consciousness beyond matter. Everything, in a sense, is based on information. Uh, even energy is based on information, symbolism, languages. Everything is based on information. But this information can be expressed in a very simplistic and abstract way through geometry, which is mathematics, the universal language of science as well as uh, seen in spirituality as symbolism. So that's where they meet. Ancient history, where does knowledge come from? Well, ancient civilizations are full of knowledge, and it seems like a lot of the stuff that we have developed over time has somehow rooted in the idea of geometry. And we can only uh, see that, uh, yeah, in these astounding, astounding architectures around the world. We know that actually today's science comes from ancient Greece, the quadrivium, yeah, the study of number, which is very important, and they put quite a lot of attention to philosophy. So metaphysics, the merging of science and philosophy, and this is what we're doing with Into Infinity. And the last part, geometry. Why is it important? Well, geometry describes space, because we're living in space, and uh, how then is the space rearranged? We know that most of reality is space. We said over 99.9999% is actually space. And the seed of life shows us uh, a possible um, way to understand the blueprint of reality. And uh, this is also, again, metaphysical thinking. We, we take this idea, and let's just follow this idea and see if we can um, confirm this through logic and experimentation. And there is a lot of data out there anyway in science, and we'll see in future workshops um, how this pattern actually can explain or just gives us another way of visualizing current scientific data. So, there I am again. I'm signing out now. This is Heike, and this was Int Infinity. Thank you all for watching. Bye.